Okay, so this is, this is where, guys, this is where the challenge is going to be tonight, okay? Because what we're getting ready to talk about is really important, okay? Because how many of you guys are planning to spend eternity in heaven? I hope everybody. Question, don't you think you ought to know a little something about eternity where you're going to spend forever and ever and ever? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And in order to do that, um, um, I'm going to ask Eliana, if you would please, pass these out. Make sure everybody gets one. And then, who wants to pass pens out? Madison, will you please grab the pens and just pass those out to everybody? That would be wonderful. Okay, um, as you're getting your handouts, okay, listen, I don't care if you take notes tonight or not, that's, that's up to you, okay? My goal with this is to just give you some information that you can lock and that you can load and that you'll always have with you. Because when people have questions about eternity, uh, and believe me, lots of people have questions about what happens to us when we die. But let me ask, let's start off with this question. Have any of you lost a loved one? Somebody that close to you that died? Oh, my brother, baby brother. Your baby brother? Like a week ago. Oh my goodness. What he did. Uh, you just put it right last here. Last Sunday. Thank you. No, last Thursday. What, what was his name? Quentin. Quentin, okay. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Do, they, do you know what happened? Not yet. We think it's Sid's, what happened to my other baby cousin. Yeah. But we're not for sure. He might have suffocated. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about you, Alicia? Really, your aunt, how did she die? Um, she got lung cancer and then it spread throughout her whole body. Wow, and you know what? How many of you guys have lost somebody with cancer? You guys ever lost a loved one with cancer? Boom, I have. And uh, it's a horrible disease to watch your loved one diminish and, and suffer with that. You guys, listen, if you haven't suffered the loss of somebody that you love deeply, you will. Okay? It's a part of life, and it's a horrible part of life. But what I want us to talk about tonight is what happens to a person when they die, okay? And tonight we're gonna answer three questions concerning that. Uh, first of all, as you'll see this, this chart, you're gonna see it flash up on the screen here um, in front of me. Um, uh, the thing about this chart is this deals, this is the timeline of your life, okay? We're all breathing, we're all living, so this is our present state, okay? When we cease to take a breath, if we die before Jesus comes back to life, we're in this intermediate state, okay? That's like the in-between state. When, we, when Jesus comes back, and then those of us who have died, we're going to talk about all of this, but those of us who've died, or if we're still alive when Jesus comes back, this is where the final state will be. We either go to heaven, up here, or we go to hell, down here, okay? All right, well, let's first talk through what happens when we die. Um, I hope you understand, first of all, that uh, there are really two types of people in the world. Like when God sees all of humanity, I mean, let's be honest, when we go to school, when we, when we see one another, we see different types of people. We see the jocks, we see the nerds, we see the, the computer guys or the gamers or the skateboarders. We've got all these little categories of people that people fall into, right? When God looks over humanity, he sees two kinds of people. You know what two kinds of people he sees? He sees saved and unsaved. Saints and sinners. Okay? That's, that's, what, that's how God sees humanity. Saints and sinners. Now, here's the question you've got to ask yourself. Which category am I? Okay? And before you answer that question, before you can decide what category you're in, because listen to me, Depending on what category you're in, changes your entire eternity, okay? Now, there's some people who think they're in this category, and they're not. And there's a lot of adults who I've met who have lost loved ones, adult loved ones, who thought they were in this category. And if I was being really honest, I'd be like, well, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure about that. Uh, they didn't say they knew Jesus, they didn't say they had a relationship with him. They, they never even cared about Jesus until uh, we're sitting at a funeral talking about him. I mean, um, it's really, really important that while you're alive, while you're in this present state, you figure out which one of these two categories you're in. Okay? And the only difference between the two? Jesus Christ. We just got done singing the song. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. That's the only difference between saints and sinners. 
It's not how good I behave or, or if I'm doing a great job of always following. That has nothing to do with it. The only difference between being a saint and being a sinner is that Jesus died for me and I'm forgiven. That's the only difference between the two categories. Okay? Questions about that before we move on? Really important that you get that nailed down before you die. Okay? You want to know for sure what camp you had your tent pitched in. Okay? Make sure you know that. All right. So, two types of people that God sees. Saints and sinners. That's all that God sees. Um, so when a person dies, guess what happens? They either go to uh, paradise or Hades. Okay? Well, let's talk through this just for a second. A person will either go to paradise, let me spell it out here for you, paradise or Hades when they die. Those are the two places you're going to end up. Notice, it's the saints, it's the, it's the saved who are going to go to paradise. It's the sinners who are going to go to Hades. Okay? Um, what about paradise and hate? Well, actually, let, let's stop right here. Uh, anybody have a Bible with you tonight? Can you look something up for me? Um, let's start right here. We'll let you look it up. John chapter 14. Okay? John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Because a lot of us are thinking, I mean, have you guys ever heard of paradise and Hades before? Have you heard of this? Okay. A lot of people, when they say, oh, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Right? We've all heard of heaven and hell. And while that is true, what we're going to soon find out from John chapter 14 in just a moment is that Jesus, heaven's not quite ready for us yet. Okay? Um, as, let me set the stage for you in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, it's Jesus' last night on earth. He's with his disciples. Yes, question? John chapter 14. You got it? Uh, verses 2 and 3 in just a second. Okay, so it's Jesus' last night on earth, and um, he is spending it with his disciples, and he has been in an upper room, he's washed their feet, remember that whole story, how he's washing the disciples' feet, and he's sitting down, and he's having a meal with them, and he's serving them communion, and he's like, hey, take this bread, and it represents my body, drink this wine, it represents my blood, and guess what he's just told them? He's just laid the truth bomb in their lap that, I'm going to die, and I'm not going to be here with you guys. Now, this is somebody who the disciples have followed for three years, 24-7, following Jesus. Okay? He, uh, he was their teacher. He was their friend. He was their Savior. And so, anyway, Jesus says, listen, uh, I'm going to die. I'm not going to be around. And, and he just looks at their faces, and they're, and they're, they're like blown away. They're sad. They're, they're hearing this news that Jesus is going to die, and they don't like it. Listen to what Jesus tells them in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. I don't know if it's right, but it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to pre and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there. You may be awesome. Perfect. You nailed it. That's exactly right. Here's the thing, you guys. Did you guys catch what it said? He says, in my Father's house there are many mansions or many rooms. He's talking about heaven. Where God is, man, there's, it's so huge. There's so many rooms. And I'm going, and what's he say? What's he going to do? To prepare a place for us, right? Prepare a place for us. So all the time that Jesus, since Jesus' death, guess what he's been doing? And guess why he hasn't come back yet? He's been preparing a place for us in heaven. And he says, I'm going to come back and get you. And when I come back and get you, you're going to go where I am. You're going to go to this place that I've been preparing for you. And so heaven isn't quite ready yet. But paradise is, and Hades is. Do you remember as Jesus was on the cross and he's dying and there's two thieves, one on his left and one on his right? What does he say to the one thief who was sympathetic towards Jesus? Do you remember? Today you will be with me in paradise. In paradise. Boom. Today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? So what are paradise and what are Hades? Well, 
Hades and paradise, long story short, a very simple definition is that paradise and Hades are the waiting rooms before you get to either heaven or hell. Okay? So what happens with saints when they die? They go to paradise. What happens to sinners when they die? They go to Hades. Does the Bible even talk about these two things? Uh, yeah, it actually does. Aiden, you want to look up something for me? Will you please look up Luke chapter 16? Okay. And let me just tell you guys this. this is, you can, if you're taking notes, you can write this down too. When you die and you go to either paradise or Hades, you get just like a little tiny glimpse. You get like a little peek at what is to come. Okay, So even though Hades is like the waiting room to hell and paradise is the waiting room to heaven... It's still very similar to what heaven and hell are going to be like. Okay? You get like a little peek at what it's like. And by the way, when we say waiting room, you guys ever been to the doctor? And you sit in the waiting room with everybody, and they have outdated magazines. You sit there, and you're reading these magazines waiting. That's not the reason you came. You didn't, you didn't go to the doctor so you could sit in the waiting room, right? You went to the doctor so you could go see the doctor. And that's like death. You're not going just so you can spend a little time in paradise or Hades. The reason, uh, you know, there's something greater beyond that. You're, you're, you're dead and you're going to eventually get to go to heaven or hell. But the Bible does talk about paradise and Hades. And Jesus uses a story about it. And Aiden, would you please read for us in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 34. Yep. And if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with it on the screen. The rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and a longing to eat and fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the finger of his of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. Okay, thank you. Mine's like completely different. Yeah, yours is King James Version, so it's going to be, it's the same it just uses really ancient language, okay? It uses these and thous and tormented. Torment, yeah, it uses, big, it uses big words. But it means the same thing. But guys, here Jesus is talking about the rich man. He's talking about Lazarus. And it's, we don't know if it's real life or if it's just a story made up. But what we do know is that um, what he's talking about here is very much real. That there is a paradise and there's a Hades, okay? And separating between the two, it used to be... I should point this out. Before Jesus Christ ascended, you know, he died, he was buried, he resurrected, and then he went back to heaven. That's called the ascension. When Jesus went back to heaven, it was called the ascension. Before Jesus went back to heaven, paradise was connected to Hades, but it was separated by a big gulf, a great gulf. And it used to be that those who were in Hades could see those who were in paradise and those who were in paradise could see those who were in Hades. Okay? But, um, Jesus, so Jesus tells this story in, in Luke chapter 16 about Abraham and Lazarus, uh, uh, sorry, rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man was in this camp of a sinner. Lazarus was in this camp as a saint. And so when they both died, one ended up in paradise, one ended up in Hades. And the rich man could look into paradise and see there's Lazarus and he's sitting next to Abraham. Remember, Father Abraham had many sons. Remember that whole song? Rich man, or excuse me, Lazarus is hanging out, eating with, with Abraham. Rich man is in Hades and he's suffering. And he's speaking over and he's like, hey, Abraham, I, I know you're a great man, so I'm not going to bother you. Why don't you tell Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and, and just let me lick his finger because it is hot. It is hot in here. All right? Let me just lick his finger off. Okay, that's all I want to do. And Abraham's like, sorry, you're out of luck. You're in Hades. Okay? That's where you're going to be stuck. Um, 
What's interesting, you guys, is that we're told that when Jesus Christ ascended, in fact, let's just look up Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Who's got Ephesians chapter 4? Uh, you got that for me, Madison? That'd be great. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. I want to make sure we're doing good on this. Yeah, we're doing good. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Let me see where it is. I kind of skipped quite a ways ahead here, but that's okay. Uh, did you find it yet? You want me to tell you what it starts with? I'll just look it up in here. Sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Got it. It starts with, in the New American Standard Version, it starts with this. This is why it says... This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Okay. So you get this, you get what it says here. Uh, let me root back up and read verse 7, and it's not your fault because I didn't tell you to read verse 7. It says, but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led the captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. Okay, what this is talking about is that um, in other translations it says he, he set the captives free. What this is saying is that paradise was moved up. It was separated even further from Hades. So now those who are in paradise and those who are in Hades, they can't see one another. And what a blessing that is that those who are in paradise don't have to watch those in Hades suffering. And that those who are in Hades don't have to watch their loved ones enjoying and having a good time in paradise. Okay, He separated the two. He set the captives free. That's what it says. Okay, So not only in paradise or in Hades do you get a glimpse of what is to come, but you're also separated by a great gulf. It used to be a smaller gulf, but now it's a much wider gulf and you cannot see into one to the other, okay? Uh, who wants to read um, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through, th uh, let's do 25, I'm sorry, 25 through 25 and 26. Luke chapter 16, 25 and 26. I'll let you go ahead and read it if you got it. Okay. Yep. And for those of you who don't have it, it's up here. Look, Abraham said, Son, remember that through and thy lifetime, you want to read it from up there? You've got King James Version. It's tough. Read it from up there. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during the life you were seeking to do good things, and likewise Lazarus, bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. Torment, agony. You're being, you're suffering. Okay? Verse 26. Chasm. Other translations read gulf, but it, it means chasm or the big, big, large section, chasm, a fixed chasm. Okay? So go ahead. So that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and not none may cross over from there to us. So what's Abraham saying? He's like, listen, you're out of luck. Not only um, we couldn't do that even if we wanted to, is what he's saying. Because we're separated by a great chasm, and we can't get to you, and you can't get to us. Okay, that's what Abraham's telling the rich man about Lazarus. Question, yes? How do I get, like, the Bible that's not all crazy? Yeah, you got it for? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so listen, guys. So here's, here's where we're at so far with this whole thing. Okay, and this may be a better picture than what's up here. This is a representation of what's up here. But two, two different types of people, saved and unsaved, when they both die, the unsaved go to Hades. The saved before Jesus rose were in paradise next to Hades. But now that Jesus is resurrected, paradise is up here. And so those who are saved, those who have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when they die, guess where they go? They go to paradise, okay? And they're with Him there. And the two are separated from, from one from another, okay? Okay, so three things happen. You get a glimpse of what is to come. You're separated by a great gulf, a great span, a great chasm, whatever you want to say. And then notice this. Once you're there, once you're there, you don't leave. 
Everybody look up here just for a second. So when you die, you go to either where? Or, that's right. And guess what? You don't leave. You don't leave, ever. Wait a second, Mark. What about ghosts? Well, what about spirits? I mean, I mean, you know, my aunt swears that she saw her husband years later after he died coming to the house. Or, or, you know, I had a cousin who had a Ouija board and we were messing around with it and we contacted some spirit. And what about that? You know, here's what I would tell you with that, okay? Is that in those situations, I don't know who you were talking to or who you saw. It wasn't your loved one. Because your loved one, when they go here, they don't leave. Okay? What I think is deal happening in those situations where there's ghosts or there's, you know, somebody who is, uh, uh, it looks like somebody who passed on from a previous life, here's what I think is happening. I believe that those are demons. Okay? Demons, of course, are fallen angels. Remember, Satan used to be an angel, he used to be up here in heaven. And he revolted against God and he wanted God's authority and God booted him out of heaven. Said, nope, not today, son. And sent him and his angels out of heaven and exiled them. So I believe those demons are fallen angels. And I believe that when people have contact with the dead, that they are really having contact with demons. The Bible tells us that Satan can appear as an angel of light. Did you know that? An angel of light. Satan can appear as an angel of light. He can make you think that you're talking to your dead aunt. He can make you think that you're talking to your dead grandma when in fact you're not. And so the best thing to have happen with the, with the spiritual life have nothing to do with it. Okay? Don't mess around with Ouija boards. Don't pretend to have a seance. Don't even open a doorway for any kind of that junk because it's dangerous, number one. And number two, you won't be contacting who you think you're going to contact. Questions about that? Okay. All right. Um, Luke chapter uh, 16. Who else wants to read? Anybody else want to read? We can give anybody else a chance. Luke chapter 16. We're going to read verse 27. Remember, this is what I said. Once you're there, you don't leave, right? Did you find a different translation? Um, hold on. <laughs> I tell you what, let me read it. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. Remember, this is still the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is what, Abraham, this is what uh, the rich man then said. And they said, I, Then I beg you, Father, talking to Abraham, that you send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus back to my father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, well, they've got Moses and they've got the prophets. Let your brothers hear them. But the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to the rich man, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Do you see what Abraham is saying here? Once you are here, you don't leave. You don't leave. You don't get to go back and warn others and be like, oh, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. You know, the Christmas, what is that? The, the Christmas story, not a Christmas story, uh, with Ebenezer Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. Remember that whole story? That doesn't happen, okay? You, you, you don't get warned by people who are dead, all right? And that's why you get one chance. You get one chance in this life, this little tiny existence, and it affects and impacts all of eternity. That's why you've got to choose well. You've got to choose wisely. Questions, comments on that? Three things that happen when a person dies, when they go to Hades or Paradise, you get a glimpse of what is to come. Those who are in Hades know that they're going to hell. Those who are in Paradise know that they're going to heaven. Okay, you get a little glimpse. You're also separated by a great gulf. And once you're there, you don't leave. You can't switch and all of a sudden go to paradise too late. And once you're in paradise, you're not going to be, you're not going to lose your salvation and go to Hades. Okay? Once you're there, that's where it goes. Okay. So, um, we're answering the question, what happens when we die? Here's the third thing that, or fourth thing that happens when you die.
Everyone who has ever lived will end up going and standing before God in final judgment. Okay? Let me just put that again. Everyone who has ever lived will appear before God in final judgment. Let me just go ahead to this next. You guys got this? Oh, sorry. Everyone who has ever lived will appear before God in judgment. Let me know when you're ready. Got it? Okay. All right. So let me just show you what's going to happen here. So here's final judgment, okay? So basically what we're told is that when Jesus um, comes back again, when he comes back for the second time, remember the first time he came as a baby, right? Born in where? Bethlehem. That's the first time Jesus came. He came as a baby. Second time that Jesus comes, guess what? He's not a baby anymore. He's coming as a warrior. He's riding a horse. It's going to be terrifying to those who are in this camp. Okay? For those of us who are in this camp, we're like, yeah, bring it on. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> For those who are in this camp, not so much. Because guess what? He's coming with a sword. Okay? Where before he was, a, he was a savior to the world. He was love and he was peace. When he comes a second time, he's going to be judgment. Okay? Um, and what happens is, so... Um, let's say Jesus, the, the last trumpet is, is sounded and Jesus is returning. What we're told is that the dead in Christ will rise first and will stand before God in judgment. Okay? That's what 1 Thessalonians talks about, chapters 3 and 4. Um, we're also told that those who are in Hades will then also come and stand before Him. Guess what happens to us? That's when we, after these two uh, places are emptied, then we get to come and stand before God in judgment. Okay? So anybody who has ever lived is going to stand before God in judgment. And I think for a lot of people who are in this camp, that's where we think, oh man, that's a terrifying thing, right? Um, how many of you have ever thought about this? That when we stand before God in judgment, that there's just going to be like this huge jumbotron screen. And when it's your turn, he's going to call Madison up on stage. And everyone's going to be watching Madison. And all of a sudden, God's going to hit a play button. And he's just going to hit the highlights of all the sins you've ever committed in your life. Is that how you've ever thought judgment was going to be? Yeah. I had that go through my mind when I was your age. I was like, oh, man. Oh, Lord. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, all the horrible things I've ever done are going to be, you know, listen, let me put your mind at ease. Okay. Let me put your mind at ease. When you stand before God in judgment, and I don't have a place for you to make note of this, but you need to make note of this somewhere on your paper. Those who are in this camp will stand before God, not to be condemned, but to be rewarded. Okay. Those who are saved, those who have Jesus Christ as their Savior, will stand in final judgment, not to be condemned, not to be punished for all the bad stuff they did, okay? But we're going to be rewarded for all the good stuff we did. Those who are in this camp, in the unsaved camp, when they stand before God in final judgment, guess what? They're the ones who are being punished for everything that they did wrong. Okay? God's going to be like, you did this in your life, you did this in your life, you did this in your life, and this is why you're going to end up here. You don't have Jesus who paid the price for your sins, and because you don't have Jesus, this is where your final state will be. Okay? Yes, Nolan. Where will they uh, like, stand before God? Yeah. Uh, we're everybody will be standing before God together in judgment. So sinners and saints, both of these camps, will gather together before God on His throne, and we each will have to give an account. And I don't know how long that's going to take. Well, that seems like it's going to take forever. But guess what? Time is of no consequence because there is no time in heaven. It's eternal. It goes on and on and on. So we can, It's not even going to seem like that long. But everybody is going to stand before God in judgment. Those who are in this camp get rewarded for the good things you do. Those who are in this camp get punished for the bad things you do. 
So wait a second, Mark. There's rewards in heaven? Yes, there is. There are degrees of reward in heaven. So while you're a Christian, while you're a saint, okay, do your good works get you to heaven? No. Okay? You're not going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, well, you know what? You didn't have Jesus, but man, you sure were a good person, so I'm going to let you come into heaven. That's not how that works. Okay? The only way that you get into heaven is through Jesus Christ. But when you get there, if you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, you get rewarded for the good things that you've done. Where do I, get, where do I find that at? Here it is. You ready? Somebody want to look up for me? Uh, Matthew chapter, and I'm skipping way ahead, but that's okay. Matthew chapter 25. Who wants to look that up for us? Yeah, Madison, I'm going to let you do it. You did a good job reading. Matthew chapter 25. Oh, that's okay. They're cheap pens. Matthew chapter 25. And this is really important, you guys. Verses 31 through 46. 31 through 46. And unfortunately, I don't have it on the screen behind me. Okay? I can't read it. Oh, that's okay. I guess we'll have to let Aiden read then, right? Yeah. Matthew chapter 25. Verses 30, uh, 30, actually back up and read verse 31 through 46. Yeah, that's what I said. Whenever you're ready. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. So I'll stop right there just for a second. Did you catch what's going on? Jesus is talking about what's going to happen at the very, very final days. He's saying, the Son of Man, when He comes in His glory, all the angels will come with Him. He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. And all of the nations, these two camps, everybody who's ever lived, breathed, all of the nations um, will be gathered before Him. And He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So he's got two categories of people, sheep and goats. Who do you think the sheep represent? Good. Good people. That's right. This camp right here. Who do the goats represent? Bad. This bad right here, right? Okay. Continue reading, Madison. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was, I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Okay, let's stop right there. Are you catching what's going on here? He's saying to the sheep, hey man... Come and take what has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. I've been preparing this place for you, and it's ready for you. Come and receive it. And he says, you have done some pretty good things. While you were in this camp, you were, you were looking out for people. You were doing some good things. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in the hospital, you came to visit me. When I was in jail, you came and, and saw me. All these things you did, right? Continue reading. Verse 37. When the, when the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did, you see, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will cry, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Okay, um, are you catching that? So they're being rewarded for the things they did. The good things they did, they're being rewarded. You saw me naked, you, 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 I was thirsty, uh, I was in prison, you fed me, I was all these things, and you did good things for me, and now you're going to go to heaven. They're going to stand in judgment, and they're going to receive the good uh, reward for what they have done. Okay, now let's see what happens to the goats. Okay, those, those people who are unsaved. Go ahead and keep reading. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me. You are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. 
They also will answer it, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not, not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment for the righteous to eternal life. Okay. Do you see the difference there? The sheep are being rewarded for the stuff they did do. The sinners, the, sh the goats, are being punished for the things they didn't do. See the difference there? And so when you and I, when we stand before God, guess what? He doesn't see our sin. Because the Bible makes it pretty clear that um, when, he, uh, when, he, when, he, when we stand before Him as followers of Christ, that, they, that He does not see our sin. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your sins for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. That's pretty clear. He's talking to the righteous, those of us who are in the camp of the saints. He's saying, I'm not going to remember your sins. I'm not going to throw it back in your face. Okay? Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they will be like wool. Okay? So that spot, that blemish that you have is going to be covered over with snow. It's going to be white. You're going to be made holy. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. If you don't have this verse memorized, lock and load it, guys. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in this camp, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation. When you stand before God in judgment, He's not going to throw all the bad stuff back up in your face. He's not going to hit play on the course of your life so everybody can see the sins that you've committed. He's not going to do that. Okay, that's His promise. So what are you going to receive? Well, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, when Jesus comes, His reward is going to come with Him. And He's going to render to every man according to what He's done. So when we're standing before God, the Bible also talks about uh, jewels in your crown. Uh, you're going to get jewels in your crown based upon some of the good stuff that you got to do. Okay, That's what we're going to do as we stand before God. Everyone who has ever lived will appear before God in judgment. That's the followers of Christ. And also the unsaved. Now when the unsaved stand before Christ... Well, they're going to not receive such pleasant words, okay? Where we get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what Jesus will say to us. Man, those who are in this camp of the sinners, they're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. You had an opportunity to know me. You didn't want to know me while you lived your life here on earth, okay? And now, this is where you're going to spend eternity. And it's a reality, Okay, so after judgment, okay, we've already we've already talked about it, but after judgment, do you see how it works? Each person will spend an eternity in heaven or in hell. That's why it is so important to make the decisions that you make here in this life. After judgment, each person will spend an eternity in heaven or in hell. Questions or comments Comments about what happens when we die? We're going to answer two more questions before we're done. Okay? Can we move on? You guys getting this? You tracking with me? Looks like you're all tracking with me still so far. Here we go. So that's what happens to a person when they die. Well, what do we get to do when we get to heaven? You ever wondered that? Okay, heaven's going to last forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we going to do there? I mean, my goodness, I'm on spring break for a week and I go crazy out of my mind because I'm so bored, right? <laughs> right, but you can only watch so much TV. So, well, the Bible tells us exactly what we get to do when we get to heaven. And I want everyone to turn to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation's the last book of the Bible. Yes. I have an idea what we could do. What could we do? Diamonds. Swim and I think you get cut, wouldn't you? Diamonds are kind of sharp. They cut glass. But you won't get hurt in heaven. Yeah, you won't get hurt in heaven. That's right. Duh. What's that? Yeah, I guess you won't bleed in heaven. Yeah, you know <laughs> that'll be something. Uh, Mitch, do you have Revelation chapter twenty-two, verses one through three? No. Sure don't. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> he's, he's checking. You got it for us, Jordan? Yeah. Read it for us, man. Then the angel showed me a river with water and life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street 
On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. With a fresh crop each month, the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. How far do you want me to read? Uh, all the way to verse 3. Three? Yep. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him. Okay, interesting that yours says worship Him. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. The New American Standard says the bond servants will serve Him. Guess what we're going to do in heaven, guys? Serve. We're serving. Okay? Like, oh, that doesn't sound like fun. Listen, when you get to heaven, you're going to be so overwhelmed with what it looks like and, what it's, and who all's there. You're going to be like, man, what can I do for you, God? It's going, to be, it's going to blow you away. It's not going to be like it is here. I know sometimes we have to pull your teeth to be like, hey, you want to you know, do a fundraiser and serve the old people meals or whatever? You're like, no, I don't want to do that. It's going to be way different in heaven. Okay. Um, one thing that I, I just want to talk to you real quick about in heaven. In heaven, did you notice that on either side of the river of life, so uh, flowing, from, um, flowing from the throne of God, is this river of the water of life. There's also a tree. Did you notice this? The tree of life is in heaven. Um, this is kind of very interesting to me. Um, I've already kind of given it away a little bit. In Genesis chapter 1, when God was creating Adam and Eve and everything that he saw, do you remember what two trees were specifically named in the Garden of Eden by God? Yes, Aiden. Uh, tree of life and the tree of good and evil. Yes, those are the two trees. So there was the tree of life, and there was the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which one were they not supposed to eat from? Knowledge. Yeah, the knowledge of good and evil, right? So they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What ends up happening to them? They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden because God doesn't want them to continue to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And so when they're booted out of the garden, guess what? Now we have an age limit. And now we only live to be about 80 years. 78 years is the average for men. Okay? But what's interesting is that in heaven, the tree of life is restored and the river of life is restored. Okay? Did you know that when you get to heaven, you're going to have, well, we'll talk about that in just a little bit too. I won't, I won't spoil that. Okay. So when we get to heaven, guess what we're going to do? We're going to serve him. Um, that's kind of important. Kind of important. Jordan, I'm going to have you keep reading because you're doing such a nice job. Would you read verses 4 and 5? Of Revelation 22. Maybe. And they'll see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no right there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them. And they will reign forever and ever. Okay. Um, so let me just back up and answer the question for you. What are we going to do when we get to heaven? We're going to rule. Did you catch that? In verses 4 and 5 it says, and they will reign forever and ever. If you're reigning, that means you're ruling, right? You're in charge of some stuff. You're going to have some authority. I don't know if that scares you. You're like, man, I can't even get my homework done over the weekend. How am I going to be in charge of anything, right? Don't worry about it. God's got it covered. He's going to put you in charge of something that um, you are more than capable of doing, Okay. Here's something I just want to point out real quick. Did you notice? In heaven, there's not daytime and nighttime. In heaven, it's daytime all the time. And guess what? We don't have a sun that's, you know, causing us to have light in the sky. What do we have instead? We have, we have the glory of God. It's so bright, you guys, that it's like, whoa. How bright is the glory of God? Okay, let me give you some examples about the glory of God. Remember in the Old Testament when Abraham um, wanted, or excuse me, when Moses wanted to see God. Remember that on, on Mount Sinai? And God's like, you can't handle seeing me. Here's what, here's what you'll get. I'm going to put you in, a, in the, the side of a mountain in a cave, and I'm going to walk by, and you're going to stare at my back. And that's going to be enough. It's going to blow you away. And so that happens. And what happens to Moses' face? He starts to glow. Like Chernobyl. Like, like nuclear. Okay? That's what happens to him. Because God's glory was that powerful and that bright. Something else that happened? Remember at the ascension? Uh, the, uh, sorry, the transfiguration? Jesus is meeting on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And who's got with them? Peter, James, and John. And man, they can't even stand to look. It's just a like, whoa, it just blows you away. What about Paul on the road to Damascus? Remember when Saul got converted to become Paul? He hears a voice, he sees a bright light, he falls to his knees, and the light is so bright it blinds him. Remember for three days? Remember this? 
That's how bright the glory of God is. So in heaven, there's not going to be a sun. There's not going to be nighttime. It's going to be bright all the time because God is going to be there and will illumine them. He will, he will brighten the place for us with His glory. That's how bright it is. Okay, But we're going to rule. We're going to reign forever and ever. Okay, well, What are we going to reign over? What are we going to, what are we going to be in charge of? Is that, is that to, you know, bother anybody? Well, here's what we're going to be in charge of. We're going to rule over the animals. Yes, there are animals in heaven. Did you know that? Yeah, all dogs go to heaven, not cats. They go to hell. So, But here's the thing, you guys. Uh, the Bible talks about animals in heaven. It talks about lions. It talks about lambs. It talks about horses. Um, uh, here's the thing about animals. They're not going to serve the same purpose that they serve us down here. Okay? We're not going to be like having personal pets. Okay? I love, I love, I love my dog too, but we're not going to have pets in heaven. Okay? <laughs> Aiden's going to eat dogs and cats. That's what he's going to do in heaven. Um, but we are going to be in charge of some stuff. And here's the thing. This is, how, this is how awesome God is. When we get to heaven, He's going to put you specifically in charge of something that He has in mind for you to do. And what your responsibility will be in heaven will be based upon how you handled things here on earth. To that who was entrusted with little, more will be given. To that who was entrusted with much, and he didn't do much with it, you're not going to get much. Yes? Cats are going to hell so they can get cooked. Get cooked? Yeah. For them to eat, you mean? For meals. <laughs> yeah. Chinese food. <laughs> buffet. <laughs> buffet in hell. Ice fails. Like the ice that filled with liquid. Yes. Yeah. The ice that fills with liquid. I don't have no idea what you're talking about, but okay. Hey, show me after we're done. We're almost done, okay? Here's the third thing we're going to get to do when we get to heaven. Guess what? We're going to worship. So everything that we do down here, what we just did tonight was a little practice session for what we're going to get to do in heaven. And for those of you who don't like to worship because, well, I'm not a very good singer or I don't have very good talent, listen, in heaven... And we're, we, as we're going to soon see, he makes everything new. So you're going to have a new singing voice. You're going to be on pitch. You're going to be like, oh, it's going to be amazing. Okay. But we're going to worship. And here's the thing I want to show you. In heaven, we're going to worship, worship continuously. It's going to be over and over. Man, we're, just, we're never going to grow tired of worshiping God. Fervently. What does that mean? With great enthusiasm. That's what fervently means. So some of you guys, as we're sitting here worshiping, you're like... Praise God. I love God. That's how you worship here. Man, when you get to heaven, it's going to be fervently. You're going to be enthusiastic. You're going to be engaged, okay? Um, and also, this is also something we need to point out, that when you get to heaven, you're going to worship God very easily, okay? It's not going to come as a chore. It's going to be very easy for you to worship Him. You can read verses 1 through 8 to talk about this. The other thing we're going to get to do, and guys, don't miss this when we get to heaven, where you're going to fellowship. It's going to be a family reunion of sorts. All of those people who you've lost, who were in this camp, who have died, it's going to be a reunion. Okay? And I don't want you to miss that. Um, real quickly, the last and final thing that we get to do when we're in heaven, we're going to rest. We're going to rest. Yeah, amen. But it's, it's going to be without boredom. You know, sometimes people, I know people who just can't sit still, you know. They always have to be doing something. A jittery, jittery, yeah. You're hyperactive, right? ADHD. ADHD. It's going to be gone in heaven. <laughs> but in heaven, you're going to rest and you're not going to be bored. You'll be like, whatever. This is cool. I can chill. It's good. It's good. It's all good. <laughs> Any questions about what we're going to get to do when we're in heaven? You know, there's this misconception that when we get to heaven, everybody's going to be an angel, right? Oh, you're going to turn into an angel and you're going to play a harp. And it's what heaven's like. That sounds absolutely boring to me. Yeah. That's not what heaven's going to be. Oh, like, playing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like playing a guitar. That's funny. Yes, question. I know I probably shouldn't ask this, but is it just me? Is it just me? Or like, I'm not sure Real. No, no, that's a very that's a very good question. Did you hear her question? Her question was sometimes she wonders if this whole thing is real. 
And yeah, that's a great question that you need to ask because here's the thing, um, it's never wrong to ask any question that you have about the Bible because the Bible, if it's true, it should be able to prove that these things are real, right? So here's what I would say about heaven, okay? Um, how do we know it's real? Well, in um, Corinthians, a guy by the name of Paul, he was talking about um, how he got to go visit this place. Like, he was uh, alive, and he got caught up in, and he got to visit the third heaven, okay? And he got to walk around and see things that, wow, nobody else gets to see. But guess what? He didn't stay there. He was the one exception to the rule. He came back, okay? He came back to earth, and he told people about what he got to see. Um, I'll find it for you, and I'll show you where that scripture is, but it's amazing. So he's just one, one of, of, other, of, of people, one testimony that I think we can look at and be like, okay, heaven is real. This guy went there, you know. Yes, Will? That's the third heaven, or the other two. Um, the, the Bible does talk about three heavens. The first heaven is the place where birds and clouds live. Okay, that's the heaven, the sky. The second heaven is where the stars and the planets live and where astronauts visit. That's the third, the second heaven. The third heaven is even farther beyond that, and it's heaven, heaven. It's the spiritual heaven. Okay? Does that make sense? Answer questions? Good question. Aiden. Uh, what about like that movie that the boys said they saw heaven? Heaven is for real? Yeah. yeah. I watched that. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that, okay? Um, with, he, the question was, in case you couldn't hear it, was what about those uh, books and those movies about heaven is for real where there's people who go visit those places and then they're like, oh, I came back, I saw a light, and I came back. Here's, here's what I would say to that, okay? I don't have the answer. I can't disprove that that, that happened. What I'm saying is that those might be exceptions to the rule, Okay, God might, if they're God's rules, He can allow exceptions if He wants to. What I'm telling you is uh, the hard and fast rule is once you're here, you don't come back. Okay? Mitch? That's all that show, Seventh Heaven. <laughs> seventh Heaven. Yeah. What's that about? Never heard of that? I haven't, I don't think. Family. Family, yeah. Oh, seventh oh, Heaven. Yeah. Oh, is it called Seventh Heaven because there's like seven people in the family or something? I don't remember either. I actually have heard that title, but have no idea what it's talking about. So, no one. Um, I remember like watching a sermon on like Kim and he like his like I think he was like arguing with Bill Nye or someone, and he, his reason was like how heaven is real. Like, what other what other logical reason? Like, what are you living for then if you're not like? Because you everyone dies and like, what's the other? Alternative. There's no other alternative. It's like you either believe in heaven or you don't. And for those who are atheists who say, oh, there's nothing after this world, what a horrible, depressing existence it is, right? What are you living for? Right. Right. For a little plug for next week, check out the movie. Right. Next Sunday. In two weeks. Oh, is it two weeks? Two weeks. Okay. The Case for Christ, yeah, on the 25th. Yeah. Hey, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that, Eliana. What are we going to look like when we get to heaven? How do we get there? How do we get there? <laughs> well, you have to die. That's, that's, a, that's a prerequisite of how to get there. Uh, real quick, I need someone to look up 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Aiden. Chapter 15. And we got a lot of verses here. We're not going to have time to read them all. I'm going to have you read just a few, a few of them, okay? 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. 1 First. First Corinthians, yep. Chapter 15. Verse oh, verses 30, starting in verse 35 through um, 58. But we're not going to read all of those because we don't have time. So start reading, and I may interrupt you from time to time and interject. So start in verse 35. And notice the title of it. What's the title of the section? The resurrection body. Okay, hold up. So, at final judgment is where we get our glorified bodies. Okay, um, that's where we get our uh, th that's where we get our resurrection bodies, if you will. Okay, he's going to describe what we're going to look like. Go ahead. Someone will ask, "How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies." When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, craft of wheat or of something else. 
but God uses it on its a body as he has determined and to each as he begins his own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another, birds have another, and fish have another. There are also heavenly, heavenly bodies and there are, are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. In the splendor of the earthly bodies. All right, let's stop right there. So the first way, the first thing that Paul says your, your new body is going to look like, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be splendorous. Okay? He says in verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and then there are earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly one is another. So basically what he's saying is your new body is going to be awesome, but it's going to look totally different than your earthly body. Okay? And while your earthly body, man, this body that I'm in, it's pretty amazing. It can do some pretty cool things. The way that it heals itself, the way that it can function, the way that it, that it, um, uh, is, it was designed, it's really pretty cool. But my new body that God is, is, has in store for me is going to be even better. Okay, keep reading if you would please. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Let, let me back up. Read verse 38 again if you would please. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Okay, so just as here on earth, as we look around the room, each of us is different and distinct. Guess what? In heaven, we're going to be different. That's what it says in verse 38. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Okay, so we're all going to have a, a body that looks different. We're not going to be cookie cutter images one from another. We're going to be different even in heaven. Read verses 42 and 43, please, Aiden. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised in perishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man... Adam became a living being. The last man, a living, giving spirit. Okay, let's have you stop right there just for a second. In verses 42 and 43, Paul says that the new body that we get is going to be better. Okay? Uh, notice some of the words that, uh, that Paul uses here to describe the difference between the earthly body and the new heavenly body. Um, the body that we have here is perishable. Okay? That means it wears out, it gets wrinkles, it gets zits, it, it's, our teeth fall out, our eyes fail. You know, the body that we have is going to wear out. It's perishable. But the body that you're going to get, the body that you're going to get when you get to here, is going to be imperishable. It's not going to wear out. There's not going to be sickness. Okay? Notice how else he describes it. The body that you get here in this world is sown in dishonor. What's that mean? Well, let's just be pretty blunt and graphic. How were each of us born into this world? We were moms. our moms, but how else were we born? Amen. Naked, naked and crying. Is that a pretty great way to, to come into existence, to be naked and crying? No. no. We were sown in dishonor, but we're going to be raised in glory. Okay? Look how else he describes it. Just a second. Look how else he describes it. This body that we have here on earth is weak. Even the strongest person on earth is weak compared to um, what, we're, what our bodies are going to look like in heaven. You've, you've heard about angels, how strong they are, you know? Angels are strong. And when we get to heaven, our bodies, our heavenly bodies are going to be strong just like that too. Question, uh, I forgot who had the first one. I think you did. Yeah, go ahead. Question? Two things. Yes. One, are, do we like, are we actually like reborn? Great question. Are we actually reborn? And the answer I would say is no. Um, so we would be the same age as when we were done. That's a great question too. Because in heaven, we're going to recognize everybody in heaven. Did you know that? Even people we haven't met, we're going to be like, hey, Fred! And it's like, we're going to know each other in heaven. How is that possible? Because hopefully I'm going to die when I'm an old man. How am I going to be recognized by the people who I haven't seen since high school? Right? Here's how. I believe that this glorified body will be ageless. 
Okay? I don't think it's going to be little babies and old men. I think what it's going to be is it's going to be a body that is ageless, but it's going to be recognizable to every person who I encountered. I'm going to look like I did similarly um, how, when they remembered how I used to look. You know, there's going to be people who remember me with hair. Okay? And like, oh, yeah, there's Mark. You know? I had hair. And um, here's, the thing, here's the thing, too, about, about this body. When we get to heaven and when we see everybody, that um, I believe, too, that even though we are going to be um, uh, recognizable by everybody, it's the part of us that's our personality, right, that makes you you, okay? That's, what, that's called a soul. Your soul is unique to you. Your personality and your vibrance and your sense of humor, Eliana, that's Eliana. We all know Eliana, right? That makes her her. And so when she dies and she goes to heaven, and I die and I go to heaven, go, Eliana! Because I'm just going to know her by her silly laugh, right? That's her. That's her personality. Oh, th thank you. You don't even know what I look like with hair, do you? No. Okay, I'll show you a picture sometime. Okay. Uh, question right here. Somebody else got a question? No one. Yes. Does there like okay, so yeah, they go to they go to paradise. Yep. Um so what when they get to heaven when they like how are they gonna like function? Like because they don't know how to walk, talk, or do anything. Yeah. They, just like, Here's the thing. They were born as babies. They're weak. They didn't know how to talk, they didn't know how to walk, they didn't know how to do anything. They can't even tie their shoes. Born in weakness. They don't even know how to walk. When they get to heaven. They're going to have a body that's filled with power. And I believe that all those babies, and, and maybe your parents had miscarriages, or, or maybe you lost a, a baby brother, um, you're going to recognize those children in heaven. And the cool thing is, is that they're going to be recognizable to you instantly. Okay? You've never even met them on this side of, of heaven, but you're going to recognize them instantly. Yes, question. And then we have to get going. Along with that, like, will they always go to heaven? Babies? Yeah. Yes. In, in our church, in our belief, we believe that babies are born without sin. That's a whole other topic for another situation. But all babies are born in this camp. When you were born, you were born innocent. It wasn't until you decided to do what was wrong and you deliberately chose to sin that you became a sinner. And the way that you got back into this camp was only through your acceptance of Jesus Christ. Okay? Make sense? No one. My last question is, when you get a... Uh... Baptized as a baby, which would be like Catholic. Yes. Does that count? Does that count? That's a long, long question. But here's the short answer to that. Okay, we would teach that baptism is for people who have believed, who have repented, who have confessed, and who are able to live a faithful life. So we would say that if a person who came to our church and was baptized as a Catholic, we would say, you know what? We need to talk to you a little bit more about what it means to be baptized and what it means to live a Christian life. So we want it to be your decision. When, when a baby's baptized, it's not their decision. It's the parent's decision. And we believe that it has to be every person's personal choice to want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so we would say you need to be rebaptized. Okay? Good question. All right. One last thing here. Um, this is what I want to end with, you guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. There's a lot of stuff about heaven that we don't know. I've never been there, but I plan on spending a long time there. And I hope you do too. This is what I want to leave you with. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. What does that word mean? Steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Like steady. steady. Great. That's a great uh, synonym for it. Be steady. Okay? Immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, what's toil? Work. work. That your work is not in vain in the Lord. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is that if you aren't in this camp, it's not too late to get out of this camp and into this one. If you're already in this camp, stay there. Okay? Stay there. Until we get to here, and then you get to experience this. Heaven. Okay, questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Will? I always like, thought about atheists like in a way where it's like, well, that can end series, like the Anthony Jesus series. Yes. Uh, last while ago. Yes. Um, it was like, he showed this, as an example, he showed this article where it was a report, a reporter who like, interviewed this atheist who basically said life was pointless. And I always thought, like, if life is pointless, then what do you have to lose? Being 
like at least trying to be a Christian. That's right. And then, like, if you're you're an atheist, you're know, like, oh, and then you die, there's nothing. And you're like, oh, well, at least it was. I was a good person. Yeah. yeah. At least, at least I, I covered my bases, if you so to speak, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm like you. Um, I, I am, I am convinced a thousand percent that everything that I've just told you is real, and that I will experience a heaven, and that Jesus Christ is real, and that He died for my sins. But listen to me, if I'm wrong about it, what have I lost? Yeah. If I'm in this camp and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to live the way that I want to live and there's no Jesus and there's no heaven and there's no hell and you know what, I'm just going to live how I'm going to live and they're wrong, what have they lost? This. Yeah. All right, really quick. Like, I'm afraid because I've already been baptized mm -hmm. and I already know, like, since that two years, I know that I've already sinned. Yes. So I feel like I kind of want to get re-baptized but then I feel like... I'll need to get, cause I, then after that, I'll probably sin again. So then... What do we do, right? Yeah. I got the answer for you. Listen, I was baptized when I was 11 years old. I was a preacher's kid. I've done a lot of sinning since I was 11 years old. I've only been baptized one time. I'm going to help you out. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Okay? Let me help you out. What do we do? If we sin and we've already been baptized... John, if you know something about the first John, he is writing to people who are in this camp. He's writing his letter to Christians. And this is what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So what that, does that mean? What's he saying? He's saying for those of us who are in this camp, we still have sin. We don't walk a perfect life. I've already accepted Jesus Christ. I've been baptized. I don't walk a perfect life. What do I do if I continue to sin? He says it. If we confess our sins, we, if we pray to God, and in our prayer life we say, God, forgive me for doing this. And what if it's lying? God, forgive me for lying to my parents. Forgive me for, uh, you name it, in your prayer, that's confessing it. Okay. Um, when you confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Does that help a little bit? So all you have to do, you don't have to be rebaptized. All you have to do is in your prayer life, as you're praying to God, spend some time and confess your sins to God. Name them out loud. God, I have, I'm guilty of lying. I'm guilty of stealing. I'm guilty of committing lust. Um, and those things are not right, God. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And he, it says right here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us each and every time. Okay? It's a good, great question. Great question. I, I wrestled with that too when I was about your age. So, any other questions? Yes. So, like, when we go to heaven, like how we sin here, would we sin in heaven? Great question. The question was, will we sin in heaven like we sin here? And the answer is absolutely not. And I'm, I used to worry about that too. Like, oh no, I don't want to get kicked out of heaven. You know, I'm going to get booted. But you've got to keep in mind that in heaven, this new heaven that God is creating... And you're like, well, how's it going to be different because Satan was there? You know, there's not going to be Satan in heaven. Satan's not going to be anywhere in heaven. And the whole reason that we sin, Satan doesn't make us sin, but he tempts us. He, he lures us. He, he, he tries to convince us to sin. Okay? That's what temptation is. And in heaven, there's not going to be any temptation. And it's going to be awesome. And so you're not going to struggle with sin. Yes? Question? Is there people that, like, are Christians that have us? Hey, let me ask you. Are there Christians who are people who are Christians who have cussed? Yes, there are. Hey, let me tell you something. Um, um, when I was in your in your age, okay, and I was a preacher's kid, I grew up in church. I had a really, I had a problem with my mouth. I had a problem with my mouth. Okay, I said some awful things. Okay, and yeah, exactly. And now I'm a preacher. Let me tell you something. Every now and then, it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then when I get angry or I get hurt, some of those old words slip out. And so yes, the answer is absolutely yes, that people still have a problem with those things. Just because you're a Christian and you're an adult doesn't mean that you live a sinless life. Okay. And so every sin that you struggle with, 
Um, some of those sins won't bother you when you get to be an adult. Some of them will bother you, and you'll have new sins that are a bother to you when you get to be my age. Okay? It's just part of, part of the human existence, part of being a human. Guys, we have got to leave. I'm going to pray. What? And then you can ask me your question when we get ready to leave, okay? But I've got to pray, and then you guys have to get on the, bus, the van.